Um, there is a lot of vitriol coming from the police patrolman's um, social media. I don't know who controls that, but um, absolutely not okay. everybody thank you for tuning in to the bpa's official podcast answering the call is what we call it my name is jamie Keneally, alongside bpa president larry calderon larry of course that was our good friend city councilor tanya fernandez anderson who we'll get to in a second but vit is it vitriol or vitriol how do you pronounce that word it's vitriol vitriol and, and i means what it means uh cruel and bitter criticism if you look it up in the dictionary yeah, okay. Well, that's that sounds right, because God knows uh, we're full of a lot of frustration and anger, given yeah. some of the comments coming out of her mouth. But we'll get to that in a second. But as always, Larry, we begin with some gratitude and appreciation for the hardworking men and women of the BPPA. Um, noteworthy praise. I mean, it's, 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 the praise is, is always well-deserved, but um, part one crime, which we know is serious crime, Larry, it's down again, you know, reinforcing the fact that Boston remains one of the safest cities in America. But crime is down. Who 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 gets that credit? Oh, that, that that's your police department, Jamie. That's the men and women in and out of uniform. Whether you know you're a member of the uh, gang unit and you're out there playing close, or, or you're the men and women answering the calls for service in uniform. We, we're the reason why Boston is one of the most safest cities in America. It's not by accident. It's because of the job we do every day. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. All right, speaking of giving some credit. Uh, Ernie Bach, Almagucha, and the Reverend Eugene Rivers. A lot of good stuff going on the past couple of weeks. What can you tell us? Yeah, great stuff. Uh, thank you to all of the, the companies and people out there that support the men and women in uniform. Uh, starting off with uh, Reverend Eugene Rivers, a strong advocate for law enforcement in the city of Boston, has been for decades. Uh, but we were able to team up with him a few days before Thanksgiving, and the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association, along with the Reverend and Senator Nick Collins, were able to distribute uh, 100 turkeys paid for by the Patrolmen's Union in our membership uh, we were able to distribute those turkeys to needy people in the city of Boston, uh, again, with the Reverend and the Senator. Felt good. Felt yeah. good to do that. Yeah, it, and, was, it was a good day. And then Ernie Bach, of course, feeding our guys and girls on Thanksgiving. Can't thank him enough. Yeah, you got to love Ernie Bach, Jr. Uh, here he is again, third year in a row. Fed every man and woman in the police department, regardless of rank or where they were assigned. That includes our EMS uh, personnel as well. Uh, over 400 meals um, for people that yep. were working on Thanksgiving when they couldn't be at home. So awesome. can't say enough thanks to him. Yep, we appreciate sure. him giving thanks. All right, I want to transition real quick to social media. Obviously, our social media efforts have been really strong with, over the past couple of years. Uh, Twitter accounts has been especially productive. Uh, but there was one tweet in particular, Larry, I want to bring to your attention. Um, and it was a tweet that got a, a lot of attention uh, about body-worn cameras. And as we know, body-worn cameras have been around for a, a, about six years but here's the, here's the thing, right? Those who pushed for the implementation of body-worn cameras promised, they promised, okay? And these are the anti-cop zealots and activists. They promised it would uncover a never-before-seen treasure trove of police misconduct, misbehavior, malfeasance, corruption. The, you know, it goes on and on. What can you tell us about that? <laughs> Very simply, it doesn't exist here in Boston, and it's very limited in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, you know, every time somebody talks to me, I remind them that we are not Minnesota. Uh, you, you know, we're not Portland. We're not the other parts of the country that have continually been in the news for police officers that act inappropriately. Here again, it's not an accident in Boston. We're well-trained, we're well-educated in the body cameras that we've been wearing for the last half a dozen years. Now you see defense attorneys in court, they don't want the body camera right. footage anymore. Right. Why? Because it exonerates the men and women in uniform. Time and time it and time again. It proves the good job that we're doing out there on a daily basis. Do we mention it enough because you know, the more you think about it, literally every officer in the city has a, has a camera affixed to his chest. And again, they said, oh yeah, there'd be all sorts of bad stuff to show. It hasn't shown anything. No, what it, what it has shown is that the men and women are acting appropriately, that they're professional out there on the street. Uh, and, and right now, the, the men and women, we're, we're having a chuckle, as you hear me kind of laugh about it, because we're going into court and defense attorneys are attempting not to allow body camera right. footage in the courtroom. The same people that claim that they would be an abundance of police officers terminated for uh, unprofessional behavior are now fighting against letting the video yep. come in against their that's client because it proves that their client, their client is the one that's actually responsible for them being in court. They don't want to roll the tape because they don't like what it sees. And as you just said, Larry, what's it show? Yeah, it shows the professionalism of our officers, something we've been uh, promoting all along. 
All right. Um, now, I guess, to the meat of the podcast, a, a couple of significant big-time hearings over the past month, both hearings sponsored by, you know, I, you know, I, I, we say it because it's true, but it's cop-hating elected officials uh, who want to defund, defame, diminish, eliminate police officers. The first hearing, Larry, was held November 7th at the bowling building. And, and again, the cop painting on full display. I, I think we have a clip from city councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, uh, again, highlighting the disrespect. Craig, if you could play clip number four, that'd be great. I think my point is taken. First of all, there's not enough black officers in your crowd. Mm-hmm. Second of all, well, second of all, you're not from here. You, if, you, if, you, if you live in rocks, oh, two, two, three, four. I mean, I, I, I'm almost stunned, and we play it so people can hear it, and we talk about the cop painting and the race painting, but the fact that at the top of the show, she mentioned vitriol. Larry, who's kidding who? Well, you say that you're using that word stunned. Let me touch that for a minute. I'm not stunned. If you were stunned at the actions of Councilor Anderson or Fernandez and Anderson, um, you shouldn't be, Jamie, be beca- because... She does this every time she takes the microphone. With her, it's about race baiting. With her, it's about uh, the color of our skin. You hear all that clapping in the background? Uh, for the for the people that are listening to this podcast, what happened is what the Patrolman Association had roughly 300 um, members that were in the crowd. That's right. And, and as she was counting, she had to stop because she was being further uh, embarrassed, as She's you embarrassed. by the laughing, yep. because we had almost a third of the members that were in the room were of minority status. And they were standing up to prove what a liar that they she were, is. They were pissed. Correct. Okay, and they stood up and they, Larry, you just said it, they embarrassed her. But, but hey, it, it only got worse because I believe at some point, you know, reinforcing negative stereotypes about police officers, you know, the old drunk, Irish drunk cop or whatever. I, I think she did pretty much call us all drunks. That would be clip number three. Craig, if you could play clip number three, that'd be great. When you have a job that you experience so much inundation of stress, inducing of visceral trauma, you're self-medicating probably, because how do you decompress? I don't know, alcohol? I don't know. But the problem... (laughs) I didn't call you a drunk, but I called you a drunk, but I... I mean, again, Larry, your reaction to this. It's it's sad again, Jamie, that to... uh, Council of... Anderson Fernandez, um, I don't know what to say about it. Every other word out of her mouth is, is baiting, it's condescending, it's irresponsible. And when I look out into a crowd of police officers, I see a sea of blue. It does not matter to a police officer whom they're sitting next to, whether it's a male or female, whether it's a a black, a a Hispanic or a white officer. It does not matter who it is sitting next to you, protecting you, making sure that you go home alive at the end of your tour. And it shouldn't matter to a city councilor who represents the citizens of Boston who is sitting in the crowd either. And for her to continually try to point it out, for her to continually try to say that the Boston Police Department is not well represented of the minority community, or to even say what she said, that we're all white, Irish, and drunk, uh, it's just... It's completely disrespectful and irresponsible of an elected official to conduct themselves like that every single time you're talking about the police department. And that's what she does because she's about spreading hate, insinuating violence and wanting to embarrass the men and women that actually provide the level of protection that she enjoys every day. It's a disgusting, disgusting, disgusting accusation. And people wonder why our police officers are angry and upset when diversity, as we've said time and time again, is our strength. We have more diversity within the Boston Police Department than any private public sector business place in the city. And she's got the audacity to make the crazy accusation she does. Of course, we're angry. Of course, we're frustrated and offended to no end given the disgusting accusation. But well, it, let's it, not. I, and I also I don't want to just uh, have this all about be all about uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Let's not forget who the main instigator of these hearings is. 
Councilor Lara yep. is just a, as much to blame yep. as Councilor Fernandez Anderson. If you listen to the entire video, or at least that clip during that piece, you'll hear Councilor Lara screaming into her microphone, there you go, Larry, there you go, Larry. This is a personality conflict with the counselor. Personal. She doesn't like anybody that stands up and says something contrary to the to the nonsense that she's peddling. She's claiming that the crowd was full with citizens that are concerned about police details. That couldn't be further from the truth. You and I both went to her well- uh, Attended, uh, quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. her well-attended meeting that Sunday night in Roxbury on Warren Street. You and I were there. We were the only two there. The yep. counselor herself didn't even show up. So let's stop the nonsense. Yeah, You have a, a, a few city councilors that are hell bent on riding this level of hate uh, against law enforcement that was running around the country after that horrible incident in Minnesota. And was it horrible? Floyd. Yes. Was yep. it wrong? Yes. But is that the Boston Police Department? No, no it is yep. not. They want to ride the cop painting as long as we'll keep them in the office. I think there's an expiration date on it for sure. But uh, but again, I mean, it, we're just playing the sound bites. And even a reasonable person at home has to listen and say to themselves, are you kidding me? This is this is what, you know, I like public officials are doing today. The race painting, the cop painting continued about a month later. The most recent hearing, which was last week. Uh, again, you know, take we take a second to listen to Tanya, uh, who seems quite comfortable, again, with the negative references. I think in this clip she refers to police officers officers is Gestapo, Nazis, Cl Cl I'm not even sure what, but Craig, if you could play clip number two. Clans members, that's what she says. Clip number two, Craig. Um, work with my colleagues, irrespective of their opinions or how they work. Everything is a conversation. I will always sit with anyone, whether it be the naysayers, a clan member, I don't care who it is. All right, you know, and again, maybe to the uninformed, we're in the hearing. She's looking at us. I mean, the, the Klan's member reference is not by accident. No, it is not. So, so let's just analyze what she does. I, I know I get a little excited myself as I'm going on and on, but this is what she's about. She pops into the hearing two hours late. She gets on camera to the general public pretending that she was there for the entire hearing. She hangs around for 15, 20 minutes. She throws out a bunch of hate accusations and hate speech. She makes fun of her own colleagues in the council who run campaigns, receive funds just like she does from her constituents in and out of the city of Boston. But she makes fun of her own colleagues in the room. And then she looks over to the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association that is sitting on the opposite side, and she makes references to sitting with everyone, whether it be a Klan's member or whoever it is. That's not by accident. It's not a slip of the tongue. Yeah. She knows exactly what yeah. she's doing. She's an educated yeah. woman, and she's there to point fingers, race bait. And then when we have the opportunity to take the microphone and actually answer questions honestly for the reasons that we're, we're supposed to be in the room, she gets up and walks out. So, I, I mean, the level of disrespect in the games that she plays, the people in the room know, her colleagues know, and uh, it's our job to point it out. And what really is riling councils like herself or Councilor Lara Councilor Bach, who made fun of us, Councilor Arroyo, is they're not used to people standing up against them. They're not used to having an organization come out. in and being, being called, called out, out for their nonsense. Not just nonsense, called out for their lies. Hate, hate speech they're, and lies. That's right. They're, they're, what they're doing is lying. And I know it's not professional to say that. We don't accuse other professionals in the room as liars. But she's lying. Yeah, and she's pretending truth. that she's there for the general welfare of the citizens of Boston that couldn't be further from the truth. But I love the fact, the lack of ownership and accountability, when you insult 1,600 hardworking police officers of all backgrounds, um, and then we say, hey, we're not okay with that. Now the new thing is, well, now she feels like she's, what, intim being intimidated? She feels like we're being disrespectful? Are you kidding me? You can't have it both ways. Yeah, I, I don't get it, Jamie. That that. That new game where she thanks some people in the crowd for calling her that she was intimidated okay. or in fear of her safety. Please. I don't know. These are, these are the same counselors that are calling the commissioner's office and other 
um, leaders in the police department continually asking for more police presence in their neighborhood, for more police officers out on the street. Great point. And then they come to these public yeah. hearings. They make fun of us. They talk down to us, and they're completely disrespectful. You made that point before. It's worth mentioning again. I love the behind-the-scenes phone call to the front desk at the district station. Hey, this is City Council so-and-so. I got a lot of stuff going on in my street. Can you send a couple of cars? But then in front of people, it's a completely different st- tune. But all right, so it's, they want to civilianize details. They want to change the contract. We've had two hearings of the month, but obviously at the end of the day, this is about a group of activists who hate police officers and think and will do everything they can to eliminate policing. Is it that simple? Yeah, it's pretty much that simple. That's exactly what it is. And I have to take a moment to say again, thank you to the men and women of the Patrolman Junior who took a day off of work or a day off of their seeing their families. And they came down to these hearings to see for themselves what we've been trying to tell them through the House of Rep meetings, that these, these counselors are just that. They're looking to take away benefits from our collective bargaining agreement. They're, they're not looking to just hurt us at the table negotiating a new contract. They're openly advocating in this past hearing to take away benefits that exist currently. They want to take money out of the budget. They want to take money out of our contract, out of our pockets, and give it to someone else for no other reason than cop hating. That's all it is. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I I spoke to one of the activists. They said, so you want want the details, you want the overtime, basically you want to get rid of us. They're like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's exactly what we want to do. We don't, we don't, we don't like police, and we blame police for the mass incarceration of community members. Yada yada yada, because we're racist. It's 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 old. It's disgusting. We're sick of it. You know. Well, you almost say, hey, you know what, Jamie? Too. Let me jump in because there was an article in the paper just last week from um, Burlington, Vermont. For, for for anyone that is in the common citizenry out there listening to our podcast, and and I hope it's plentiful. Go back and Google search Burlington, Vermont. They have exactly what this handful of Boston City Councilors is trying to achieve. They cut their workforce by a third during the demonstration periods the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Then they cut it again by another 30%. So they went from roughly, um, I'm going to ballpark because I don't have the article in front of me, but they went from about 120 offices down to 90, now down to 60. And now they have four murders in the last two years. They have um, a a stolen bike and automobile ring up there. And because they don't have police officers to go out and police the general area, they now have community watchmen again. It's like we're turning the dial back to 1854, where we have citizens that are going to go out like the Wild West, catch people, find them guilty, and hand out the sentence all in a 20-minute period, I guess. But I, I, I don't know. If you live in Burlington, Vermont, you, you better do something extra to lock up your, your bikes, your cars, and, um, and, and hope like hell, I hey, guess, you that call, you don't get shot in yeah, the street because you, they don't like their police in Burlington, and you, that's where Boston's right, headed. Right, and when you call 911, just be prepared to wait on, on hold for your emergency phone call. Sorry, there's no one here to take your call, but we'll be, we'll be with you in you know, fill in the time, 30, yeah. 40 minutes. Ask, ask that person to hold on to that yeah. um, that weapon and please don't assault. Oh, someone's ringing in your house uh, yeah. and they're armed. Okay, we'll get, yeah, we'll get to it best we can. Um, you know, the, the most recent hearing, though, Larry, last week, collective bargaining, our contract was on the on the discussion or, uh, you know, on the table for discussion. And it, it just, I don't know, I, a lot of people I spoke to she said to me, it seemed kind of, uh, inappropriate to hold a discussion hearing about collective bargaining with collective bargaining actually going on. Is that a fair criticism or no? I, I, I don't know if I would call it inappropriate. Look, at the end of the first council hearing on details, I was imploring the council to get on the mayor's back to settle the BPPA contract. It would be great if the city council would do their job if they would speak to the mayor, apply political pressure to the mayor, tell her to pay the men and women of the Boston right, Police right. Department for the reforms that she claims she wants, but pay us fairly for the job that we do. Uh, Councilor Anderson, she's in the, in the hearing saying that she wouldn't do our job for the pay that we receive. Yeah, And I agree, she's, she's probably speaking from the heart because we do deserve more. But the job of the city council is not only to represent their constituents, but if they want to get involved in the collective bargaining of any city agency, their role should be to pressure the mayor to sit down, to bargain fairly, to bargain um, quickly, and and get to what is a a, a fair benefit, a fair wage um, package. And if there are reforms to be had on the city side, 
That's what negotiating is all about. Yeah. That's what the council should be doing. But these hearings are not about our contract. Not about supporting they, they, they claim, your contract yeah, at they, all. They claim that it is, Jamie. They yep. started off by saying that it's um, an opportunity to look at the timeline of the Boston Police Patrolman's contract. But yet they had a panel that did not include the Boston Police Patrolman's Association bargaining team. Well, let me ask you the question. Were you invited to the, the first hearing? No. November 7th? And were you, were, you, were you invited to the last week's hearing? No, we were not. How awesome is that? But you gave testimony, Larry, and, and I, folks who haven't seen it, um, I know we sent that out to the membership, but strong as always. And the thing you brought up, which I thought was, 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 was powerful, we're talking about paying our police officers, and you bring up the fact that you seem to have a problem with paying your police officers, but they have no problem paying themselves. Uh, I believe there's a 20% pay hike they recently gave themselves and, and and I mean in terms of hypocrisy how bad is how bad is that yeah I, I mean look when I when I gave my speech this time I made sure to stay underneath the five minute threshold that uh, Councilor Bach gave me because I didn't want her pounding the you gavel, and, gavel and told and, to leave and, right? yeah and shutting yeah. off my microphone and yeah. you know coming up and grabbing my arm and all that nonsense um well let me yeah. I gotta stop you since you brought yeah. it up you stayed in the pocket you refused to surrender the microphone. You stood strong. Clearly, they didn't realize that you were one guy representing 1600. The disrespect was ridiculous. But just tell me about you know your decision making to say, hey, I ain't letting go of the microphone until my members uh, are spoken for. Well, that's part of my that, that was part of my speech as Councilor Bach was banging the gavel and threatening to pull the microphone and shop, Larry, stop the film. Stop I, I was not giving up the microphone specifically for the reason that I stated that the men and women of the Patrolman's Association took their day off. They were not invited as a panelist. They waited over two and a half hours for their voice to be heard. And damn it, I was going to have that voice heard. I don't care if she bangs that gavel. As you heard me say, she can bang that gavel yep. all day long. We are taxpaying citizens. Not yep. only are we police officers, not only are we the biggest union our city in the city too. of Boston, it's yep. our city too. Yep. And if, if the members want to be heard, they're going to be heard. And that's what they elected me to do. Well, the best, though, is these panels. So you give a panel of four, four people saying the same exact thing, two hours to crap all over police officers. And then you get up and they, they start to gavel you after two minutes. Are you kidding me? Well, they don't want to be heard. And it's part of what I said in both hearings. Um, ho hopefully it came across better in hearing two because I was actually able to have a full five minutes. Um, but they don't want to hear the truth. I gave them facts. Facts. They just penned a 20% raise for themselves. Yes. Some of the counselors without even having a year under their belt. That's awesome. But they don't care. That's awesome. It's a money grab. Of That's course. all it is. Yep. And instead of paying the men and women in uniform that are out there sacrificing and putting their life on the line, providing that safety for them, they crap on them, yep. like you say. Well, we're, so we're, it's Warren not Buffett, about us. We're Daddy Warbucks. We're, you know, we're, we're, the, we're, we're the rich, I guess, in this crazy reverse Robin Hood scheme. Yep. Uh, let's wrap this thing up, but I think sure. you need to make the point again. You know, you keep saying it. You need if you want to cut overtime, if you want to open up those details or see those unfilled details get filled. It, this is this is about manpower um, being understaffed, shortage of employees. Why is it important to hire four hundred police officers? Well, I, I'll, I'm going to answer that in a second. But I, let's stay on the contract because it's important. Um, or better yet, you need to hire four hundred police officers, Jamie, because. We can't fill the shifts on a normal eight-hour basis in a 24-hour period, as been proven by the overinflated red in our overtime budget. So, Councilor Flynn's doing a great job at pounding that home publicly. We need, we need to hire hundreds of police officers over the next three years, yep. hundreds yep. every year. Yep. Um, but but let's touch the contract because you, you talk about what will it do if we hire a few hundred police officers. Not only will police officers that don't want to work get the much-needed rest. But the details that they claim that are going unfilled will then be filled by officers who have the availability to take a detail. Or available. Yeah, there's, there's many reasons why details go unfilled. Uh, but one of the main reasons over the last several years is because we don't have enough manpower to fill the regular shifts right. on a regulatory duty. Thus, details go unfilled. So it's, it's a game that I think has been strategically orchestrated by some people at City Hall over time. Uh, but I don't, want, I don't want people to read into... You know, accuse me of too much paranoia, but staying on the contract, if we hire hundreds more police officers, jobs will be filled. If the city really has uh, a desire to fill the unfilled details in the city, well, that's what negotiating is all about at the collective bargaining table. 
and we've been reporting to the House of Reps for months now, that part of those conversations include a hierarchy of officers to perform paid details in the city of Boston. So I want to make sure that I get that out on this podcast, as I know our members have been commenting that they're learning a lot, they're listening, and they're hearing things that maybe might be left out or they missed a roll call or whatever it might be. But look, we're looking at a hierarchy of detail distribution here. And what does that mean? That means uh, consistent with what we do today, patrolmen and and detectives being top on the list, we get priority, Uh, supervisors in the Federation after the fact. But if the city of Boston is really willing to talk about the collective bargaining agreement and reform some of the pieces of the detail system that could work better, uh, we, we have uh, surrounding communities that could share details, Dedham, Quincy, Everett, Malden. Um, retirees, I think you mentioned. Re- re- we have a retiree yeah. system. I mean, we've had a retiree bill that was signed into law now several years ago. Um, when I was in your role as a legislative director, we had that passed. Uh, each commissioner has refused to sign that in. Um, we, we could take school c- campus police officers and give them the same authority to get on the list and do details. Uh, we have communities like Needham that we have stopped and spoken to their hierarchy. They've been using school crossing guards and, and cadets to do their unfilled pay details. Yep. So we have, uh, I don't know how many police cadets we have now. We're, we're somewhere upwards of 60 to 80 police cadets. There, there are a lot of sworn and semi-sworn individuals in and, and around the city of Boston of options. that could help yep. and give the city of Boston options to go to. That does not include... Civilian flaggers. Civilian flaggers. Oh, by it the does, way... It does not include starting a new multi-million dollar operation, another bureaucracy, yep. more, another, more money gra- another money grab, another money grab by by greedy city councilors who want to hire their brothers and sisters and then claim they didn't know they weren't supposed to as an elected official. It, it's um, it's you know, awesome to watch though because again, as we've yeah. said a million times, there is no, again, added layer of public safety protection at zero cost to taxpayers. There's nothing they can suggest or recommend that's going to save money, and it, and it's and it's 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 laughable to hear the lengths in which they will go to defame and to diminish and denigrate police officers to steal work that historically belongs to us. Well, that's it's just amazing. how I was. That's just how I was going to end my rant, Jamie. Well, yes, end it with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The public paid detail system in the city of Boston works. The reason, it's a model. one of the reasons that we are the safest city. In America. That's right. And it is a system that is not totally broken, does not need to be repaired. Yep. Can we do it better? Yes. Can we employ um, sworn and semi sworn offices to help protect the citizens of Boston while there's major construction going on? Yes, we can get there. And it's free to the taxpayer. I guarantee you free that Free Ever- safety, yeah, free police. I, I guarantee you, Eversource, oh. Verizon, they're not going to refund 39 cents a month on your phone bill or your heating bill because they don't have to pay police no. tales, details. If anything, Jamie, they have to. P- pay an inflated laborers rate in Massachusetts because that is what happens when you hire a flagger. It's going to cost more. You're in a prevailing wage state in Massachusetts. It's going to cost more money to put a flagger in. You know who's going to pay for that? The taxpayer. Not Verizon, not Eversource, the taxpayer in the city of Boston. So zero cost to lots of cost. It's a great idea. Yep. Thanks, Jamie. On that note, Larry, um, We'll wrap up the podcast, as always, to our members. Thank you for listening. And, of course, we thank you guys and girls for for making Boston one of the safest cities in America. You're you're out there 24-7, 365. Can't thank you enough. Again, until next time, he's Larry Calderon. I'm Jamie Keneally. Stay safe, everybody. Yeah, Merry Christmas, everyone. Spend as much time as you can with your family. You're doing a great job out there. Thanks, Jamie. And it's absolutely BS just to keep quorum or else they'll start talking trash about how I cuss all the time. And honestly, I think it's a true art form and I love the F word.